What's up everyone? It's the Zora Hype here, Kyle, with the last entry into the vlog for the interviews. And this one is part two for the interviews for Miltos, who played Serial Pharrell, Kate Dickey, who played Lysa Tully and Lysa Aaron, and the lovely Paula Fairfield, the sound designer for Thrones. So I hope you all enjoy these interviews. It was an absolute blast working with these people and asking them these questions. Me and George had a blast interacting with all of these amazing people that are connected to Game of Thrones. Please enjoy. Next stop, asked him to, to do something for him unwittingly, which is, I want you to protect my daughter. I want you to teach her. She wants to learn. And why not learn to defend herself? I don't think he was teaching her to go out and and revenge her father's death. I think he was he was literally teaching her how to not die. Because they're in in, in, West, in, in in King's Landing, which everyone knows is incredibly dangerous and it's full of people who want to kill and I, and I think that's really his main role. So I think he would be a bit disappointed. Because remember, he's also, he's not, he's, so these, you know, the thing is, what do we say to the God of Death on today? It's, it's about staying alive. How do you, how do you stop dying? And I think that, that was the lesson. Not about how do you exactly prevent your father's death. I don't think that's because that's only going to. I mean, you see, I know they, they portray it really well. And Maisie does an amazing job with that performance. I never forget the way that she looked at the hound when she left him for dead. I thought that was amazing. I thought that is about. I mean, I'm like going. This is. I don't. Not very happy with the way that she's turned. She turned into this cold, kind of callous, broken. Next question. Have we gone on up? I have another one. Yeah. Um, so, hi. Uh, oh, I gotta get this on camera. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, hypothetically, if Sirio was a faceless man, whose face would he want to take in Westeros? something that would be a really big twist. It would be such a twist. It would be something like having uh, I don't know. <laughs> it, it would be ha it would have to be one of the main protagonists. It would be like having taking his face off and it's who could it be? Little finger? Oh could it be I mean I always thought that it's it's it, it, it's it's like if he had if he was impersonating someone, it wouldn't be like he's always impersonating them. Mm -hmm. He's just impersonating them in that moment. He's tied them up somewhere or killed them. But actually, the person he's impersonated is something like I don't know. Yeah, little. I I can't, I can't get my head out of it. It would be amazing if he's actually a little thing. Because some people think that you know Jack and Hagar and this of that. Of course. Yeah. Of course, but I don't know. So, so imagine if it was all a test. So Jacken does a, 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 this whole ritual with her, pushes her, hurts her, almost kills her, just for a test. It does feel like that at the end when he smiles and lets her go. That's like, always kind of like struck me as, it's, it's, like, like, it's like, hey, this you is what he expected. You. It's like, this is what he expected. I don't know. I, I, I found that smile that Tom does is, is like, what does that mean? <laughs> what is that about? Because that was, in, I thought that was really interesting. Thank you. You said that it would, it would be interesting to see Sirio Perel run into Ari again at the end of her story. You don't know what's going to happen, but you have theories. You think Ari is going to die? And you think Sergio Pharrell's gonna kill me? Oh my god. Oh, what could you imagine? To but stop I, the you monster. Imagine? That's the it's question. like Dr. Frankenstein having to kill his monster that he's created. Maybe. Because Sergio Pharrell could be from the House of Black and White? Did she go? That's quite deep. But wait a minute. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just like, I'm like, is that? Yes, of course. Jesus. I think she has to die. 
she's not going to make it through the end of the show. Why do you think? For a, for a small moment, it looked like she'd given up on the idea of revenge. But, but she hasn't, because when she says, I am not no one, I am Arius Dunn of Winterfell, it's like going, I'm reclaiming what's happened to my family. I'm reclaiming that pain. I'm sure that's what she's doing. She's not just going, I'm standing up for myself. I think that she's reclaiming that pain that she's kind of losing by becoming faceless, by becoming non-emotional, by becoming like a, a robot, okay? which is what all the, that, the, you know, the, the, house, the faceless men are about. It's about being no one. She's going, I'm not no one. I'm a girl who lost her father and her brothers, and I am going to get my revenge. So she's been put back on a course where she is going to put herself directly in conflict with people like Cersei, with Jamie Lannister. Mm -hmm. As I don't, I cannot see how that's going to end well. I have my mind spent. Okay, I have no questions. <laughs> Jeff, I love you for asking. <laughs> 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 I have nothing else to on that. I find this quite fascinating. I sometimes don't spend any time talking so, about these things. Actually, I have. Sometimes no, no, I, my, my I, comment. I can go where she's so, so, earlier on in the show, Aryan says to Gendry, I'd be your lady. We know he's back on the show this season. Do you think that he can quell the beast? Or do you think that he might be what is able to, able to pull her back from that edge that you were just talking about? I think they're going to come into conflict because I, I think Gendry's going to come back a very different person. Is Gendry still rolling? He's going to have like. He's 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 going to come back a different person because I've got a feeling that he's going to have something to do with the Brotherhood without banners. I think he's going to be a new disciple to the Lord of Light. I think he will be different. I, I don't think he will be the same person that 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 we saw. Was it episode three, uh, series three? Yeah. I think he's going to be different. I think I think he'll be radically different. I think he will be like like almost unrecognizable. I wouldn't even be surprised if he's scarred and got missing one eye. And actually, kind of reminds you of Don Darian. Like, hang on, no, no, no. anyway, that's just me hypothesizing. But I think. <laughs> I think I think they could come into conflict. I think they might find that they're on opposite sides. And remember, the Hound is now involved in it. And what did Arya do to the Hound? She left him for dead. I don't think this is going to be easy to kind of fix these things. The Hound kind of kept her at arm's length, thinking that she was a bit just sweet and, you know. But I think no, this is and this is what I love. This is what I mentioned in the in the in the in the that, that panel we have is that it's going to be really it's going to be a lot of conflicts. We're going to go. I don't know who to side with here. I think that's where we're going to be in season six, six uh, seven, and eight. Six and seven. So where are we? Seven, seven, seven and eight. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. Uh, this is not more of a question, but I want to kind of create a conversation here. Uh, I, I do theory videos on YouTube, and I, I had this theory because um, we have the seven gods, uh, and, and Arya can be a representation of the stranger. And in High Valyrian, uh, the Valonqar is represented as gender neutral. So is it possible that, because we hear Melisandre say blue eyes, brown eyes, and green eyes, and Cersei's eyes are always described as wildfire, in the books very, very specifically by George many times. And I'm thinking, and this, this is just me, and I'm thinking that Arya is going to take out Cersei. That, like, but maybe... That's what I told you. Me, me and George have discussed this a bunch of times, but do you think that, because you said that she could get in that direct line of conflict, maybe that's how she gets there, man. I, I don't know. Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts I on really that? I really think maybe? the Lannisters are who she's after. I 
think she's after the Lannisters. She's going, I think she absolutely knows what she's doing. I think she knows, she knows Jamie Lannister was on her list. And I think, I think it's going to put her directly in conflict with those two characters. I really do believe that. In, in, in ways that we won't expect, because we just think, oh, John and Danny are now, are now fighting the Lannisters. I don't think it's as simple as that. I think I think they're going to go to war, but you know what happens with the leaders of wars like that is that they're not in direct conflict. They will they will fight. They will have a war. But I think the minutiae of how those two meet their ends, if they meet their ends at all, will be up to like. I think Ari will be involved in that somehow. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, seriously. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah. Um, sorry, the boss can you have to me as well? All right. Thank you so much. Any what other up? recorders? Yes. <laughs> thank you. You want to put that up on the oh. It's always lovely to have the first question. So I guess, like, my, I'm curious. You have this, you, you, you've done, obviously, uh, stage acting in my room. So you, you come to this character and the character is quite a, a contradiction of, of characteristics and influences and like, how did you, when you first read it for this part, what, what were your thoughts about portraying somebody who's kind of got this type of personality? It must have been fascinating. Oh, it was fascinating and I was really excited. Um, I didn't expect to get the part because physically I'm the complete opposite of lies in the books. Lies is a beast and a very different physicality, so I just didn't expect to get it, but I was fascinated by her background, because what I do as an actor, for every part, is I write backgrounds to my characters. It's what I do, I go right back to when they were young, and I imagine their life. It could be completely wrong, but I try and imagine it. So I went back and looked at all of Liza's history. I read the three books up until she died, and find out about all the stillbirths and the miscarriages and I just try and find where the damage is done and then I bring it back to the present and things like that. So it's exciting to play someone and do you know what's different about Liza as well and I've talked about this quite a lot this weekend is Liza doesn't have a filter or an edit button like a normal person so in life we're always pretending we're fine and we're not and most of the characters are as well. But with Liza, she couldn't hide anything, so I was, it was just exciting to go in such extreme, from one minute to this, to this, to this, and that was the kind of tricky part, was making sure it was as truthful as I could, and not make it out like a pantomime body, um, and make sure there was a lot of pain and truth in these moments, so it was a joy of a part for me to get. And did you, when you were reading the books, did you clue into the fact that how influential this character is to the whole arc? I mean, oh, she's read it I know. Yeah. That was really exciting because she's on the periphery. You would never imagine that actually she started the whole thing mm -hmm. by writing to Kat and saying it was a Lannister and said it was her and the whole thing with Littlefinger. And you don't realise too much later on, like, she's been so influential. And it's just such a joy to have those little kernels inside you. And I didn't know in the beginning how that would be revealed or if it would be revealed. You don't know what they're going to take from the books and use. So it was really nice in season four to eventually kind of blurt out the secret of basically it's my fault this whole thing's going on. So yeah, it was a wonderful part to get. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Okay, uh, your character in the show was very well protected, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with the people she loved, by Robin, by Lord Barish. Uh, do you think ex uh, uh, love and madness have a point in common? Well, I think there's a very fine line, isn't there? I think um, love is such a big emotion that if it gets out of control, it can tip anybody over the edge really, you know, in any life um, and become an obsession. And Liza's love for Littlefinger goes back to when she's a teenager. 
she's been in love with this man since she was a really sweet girl. But he's always been in love with Kat and she knows it. And then when she got, I don't know if you know the backstory to Liza, but she got pregnant by Little Finger as a teenager. And her father made her abort the baby and he married her off to John Aaron, who's 13 years a senior. And Liza went through a lot of stillbirths and miscarriages and it was that really that set her over the edge. So when it comes to her having Robin, she, or the way I, I got my head around the carriage is I thought, here's a woman who's tried to have children for years. And so when she does have the child, it becomes this really unnatural obsession, really. And she can't let go of him being a baby. And she wants the baby. And this is how the whole breastfeeding thing. And um, so I think there is a real common thing. I think love can turn anyone mad, really, if you were in the wrong circumstances and you're loving someone that doesn't love you or you're aware that your control of a situation is slipping from your grasp. It can make people act like maniacs, you know, and feel completely out of their own bodies and minds, really. So I just kept trying to find the truth in that, and then obviously it was huge for Liza, but trying to keep that kind of truthful element. I've been in love with people that haven't been in love with me. I used to get dumped all the time when I was young and be heartbroken. But I didn't, you know, I didn't go to the extremes of Liza, but you know that kind of unrequited love that can send you bananas. So um, I felt like a, a lot of sympathy for Liza, even though she's horrible to people. There's always, always reasons for people's behaviour. People act in certain ways because of your past great experiences and your past terrible experiences so yeah I think there's a real fine line between love and madness if it doesn't go your way and it's not given back to you you know thank you okay uh, hi. hi again hi. um <laughs> huge cake fan girl I know oh, I like uh, a Daxi fan girl <laughs> so we can be mutual and well, I love we um I'm 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 curious actually uh, because we've we've asked questions about Liza and we've gone we've, we've gone through a lot of this stuff over at uh, you know, over at our website, um, but I want to I want to give people a, a more of a picture of Kate. So if you don't mind going back a little bit into maybe what your influences were, what got you into acting, I mean, the, the area that you're from is you know was not known to be a hotbed of acting for the longest time. So you yeah. must have felt like a duck out of water with your interest. So just. Tell yeah. us a little bit about your influences and what got you into all this. I get into acting in primary school. I was in uh, what you would call year four, and this letter came to school saying that this drama club was starting on a Saturday morning. And my family, have, uh, since I was small, I was called, well, not called nasty, but you're so dramatic, Kate. I was so emotional. It was like I felt I'd been born with twice as much nerve endings and emotions as everyone else. And I didn't really know what to do with all that emotion. So this letter came round primary school saying, if you want to start this drama club, you know, write a letter and say why. And I got on to it. And I think it was after the second or third week I came home and went, this is what I'm going to do in my life. Because I suddenly realized that I had somewhere to put all this emotion. I could put it into characters. And you could have these make-believe worlds. And um, I didn't really know it could be a job because when you watched film, like when I watched films as a youngster, it was so far removed um, that you d I didn't really realise that someone like me could do that. And I come from a really working class background. There's no actors, you know. And uh, but my mum and dad were amazing, and the teachers weren't encouraging at all. They told me I was being silly. But I had one, my drama teacher and my parents, and my dad especially, said, you've got one life. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, you go after what you want to do. So he was great. So I then went to drama school. I never, ever thought about TV and film. It was always about theatre for me. And I did theatre for about 10 to 15 years. And then 
Andrea Arnold's been a massive part of my life because she cast me in a film called Red Road and I'd never done a film before and I was cast as a lead in this role and it was a really dark movie, it was surprisingly well enough. <laughs> and uh, she taught me so much, she just taught me about truthfulness and about um, giving characters the voice they deserve and things like that. So she was a big influence. A lot of theatre actors influenced me in the beginning and uh, I kind of started catching up in films. Um, there's a film called Truly Madly Deeply Yes. That's like the ghost, but you know, and that was a massive film for me at 19 or something. This kind of raw emotion, and I loved uh, Ken Loach movies. Ken Loach has been a massive um, influence on me. That kind of realness, and I just got quite. I've been quite obsessed about finding truth, and I've also got quite obsessed with giving voices to people that I feel are maybe not getting heard or. I like playing unlikable characters because, like I was saying, there's always reasons and I love unpicking them and going, but why are these people not nice or why are they scratchy or why, you know, so I'm just fascinated by human behaviour. I sit in the park a lot and people watch and find characters and I don't know who they're going to be, but I just watch people all the time. I'm fascinated. So, that's kind of been my, and so when I got uh, given the red roll, uh, the red roll, the red road roll, I had no idea about it. I'd done a little bit of TV and I'd done one short film, but Andrea Arnold taught me so much about less, less, less. Because in theatre you're trying to reach the back row or you're trying to fill the room. And I've made some horrific mistakes <laughs> as I went along my career on screen, on there forever. But it's kind of how you learn. You've just got to learn. So it's all, always been the kind of real, raw things that have caught me. I like the more depressing, the more I love it. I don't, I don't know why. I'm just fascinated by people's do you think, difficulties. Do you think that's how they found you for The Witch? Which I've told you is brilliant, but if none of you have seen The Witch, you oh, might yeah, have was... Who hasn't seen that? Have you okay. seen that? Uh, yeah, it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, I don't know where, I think it was Red Road that Rob had maybe seen me in. I'm not sure who where right. the director had seen me in. And uh, we had to lose, all. I had to lose nearly, I mean, between 20 and 30 pounds. And I'm not big. Right. I was emaciated for that. And I mean, as a control, I wasn't just. And, uh, yeah, I think Rob just, there was something, me and Rav, I auditioned, Rav was already cast as something special happened with our chemistry. And we felt it in the room, me and him. I didn't know if Rob had felt it, but I was, it was pretty full on. And then Rav was like, oh God, I'm working with you, I need to raise a bar. And I was like, no, I'm working with you, I need to raise a bar. And it became, not like a competitor, but we really were like, we're going to go for this and we're going to, embody these characters as much as we can and uh, Rob Eggers, oh I can't say enough good things about him, he's an amazing director and I can't wait to see what he does next so yeah the witches we made it with a lot of love a really lot and, and we moved to um, northern Ontario and we lived together for a week or two as a family with just doing bits of rehearsals and like get to know each other, we kind of made this really strong family that then we just broke to pieces and ripped apart, and it was it was great. So I get a lot of influence and in things from people I work with. I learned so much from fellow actors or directors or crew members or it's like constant evolution. Yeah, yeah. and I just feel lucky to have worked with the people I have and get to be in the room with them. And God, look at the way they act, and look at the way he directs, or, yeah, I've got a lot of influences, really. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, but, yeah, I, I do other stuff, and it's a good thing. I, I sometimes have stuff that overlaps, and, and it's, while it's crunchy, it, um, it, it allows me a break a little bit. It, it's nice to kind of go back and forth between projects. Hands of Stone was a project that went on for almost three years. So I was off and on it, off and on it, off and on it. And yeah, there were times that there were a couple of train wrecks, but it just meant I didn't get to sleep for an hour. Um, 
on. I mean, I, you know, nobody ever knows what I'm working on while I'm working on, you know, whatever my client is, they don't know, and it's like, it doesn't matter. It's seamless to them, because if I have to stay up for three weeks to finish something because I stupidly said yes to something else and it happens to collide, you know, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, and, and I find Game of Thrones is just one of those things. I mean, I, you know, at this point I've been on it long enough that I don't have to, there's small things I have to suss out, and this season there's some goodies coming up, and I had to work on. Uh, but a lot of the stuff, the dragons at this point, you know, I've got a, uh, I mean, they grow and they grow and they grow, but the building of them is less, is less labor intensive than it was when I started from scratch. You know, although I redesigned a lot of stuff this year for them because, I mean, they're dragons. You know, again, what I was saying before is that they have to grow up, so. I have to take some of the sounds that they make in a season and pitch them, stretch them, make them bigger, keep those parts, but I have to add new stuff to, to you know, fill out where they are, you know, uh, in their relationship to, you know, Khaleesi, in their relationship to each other and what they're doing. Um, so it will call sometimes for specialized vocalizations, but it's not as hard, it's not as much brain work right now for me because it's, it's so established and I've got a good blueprint for myself, but the new stuff can be very grueling sometimes to find, to find the special thing that'll, that's magic, that you'll just go something you've never heard before. And that's, that's always my, you know, it's like we were talking about before, it's something I'll always chase to find, find that thing that makes that so special, it makes it memorable, it makes it, you know. So I've got a couple of things this season that I'm working on that, um, you know, this season is utterly special. I mean, it is beyond, you can't even imagine. And, and part of that has to do with the fan base, you know, it's a, the fan base is so supportive, it allows more money to come in, and, and that's what we're experiencing for the final two seasons. Um, they, you know, in, in, in the dragons, for instance, are interesting. All of the stuff and the visual effects are, are insane on the show. Yeah. The dragons are very, very expensive um, to make. You can imagine. I mean, they're, they're so incredible the visual effects. For me, it's so exciting. I mean, I'm sitting in a room with a freaking dragon. You know, it's crazy. But um, in Pat, you know, as the show has progressed, you know, each year they get a budget for a few more dragon shots, and they have to be very careful how they use them so much this year, not so much anymore. That's what I'll say. <laughs> More I'll say that they, you know, now it's, it's uh, there's not so much having to hold back in the plan because, you know, there's a lot of dragon action this year and it's fabulous. It's really a lot of, a lot of action, there's so much stuff this year. It, it, and even though it's only seven shows, you're getting like nine shows with this year. Year. Next, the finale I've heard it will be six shows, but I've heard it will be feature length. Uh, so it's, you know, this show, I mean, I think the finale is 82 minutes long. You know, it's yeah. not, yeah. that's almost twice what they. It's a record, I think. Years, you know? Longest one. Yeah. Longest one, I think. Huh? I think it's a record. It's the longest, longest episode. Is it? Yeah, I, I'm sure. And next, the finale, I think that will be like that. So, um, yeah, all of the shows, and most of them are around an hour or over. <laughs> Except for uh, except for the finale, which is gigantic. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm Michelle from the Daily Dot, and I'm kind of wondering uh, when you're asked to kind of design, you know, sound for something for like a, a key moment. Um, for example, the, the set blowing up and everything leading up to that. Um, how when you're when you're doing that, do you know if there's going to be like a big kind of orchestral piece in there? Like how does it combine when this when the music comes in? I don't. I mean, I do. The music has been okay. I love Ramin's music. It is absolutely freaking spectacular. The fact that that guy has never been nominated for an Emmy. Yes. Yeah. Criminal. Yeah. Criminal. Yeah. I don't yeah. even understand it. So I just want to say that first, and his score this season is phenomenal. The problem for me is, it's always the battle of sound, um, and I usually lose, so. Uh, I say to people when I teach sound designers, sound, sound, they, you know, 
enjoy the moment, that last moment before you release your stuff to the mix stage, because it's it's the last time you'll hear it in all its glory. Then that it gets to the stage becomes the push pull with music, and you know. One of the things with the dragons, like I was saying, this season, it's like, damn, you know? It's like, because as soon as the dragons appear, there's always this like, oh, you know? And it's like, could you just give me one second before you do that? <laughs> so I can have a little huh myself, and they, you know, so it's just like, who's going to get the, 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 the shiny moment, you know? But it's, it's tough. I mean, I have to deliver in absolute full detail. I mean, you can't even imagine. And, and the wings, the skin, the tie up everything, the little thorny things that are flapping around, you know, all that stuff has got to be there. Because the second I skip something, because I think, oh, music's going to be there, and it's exactly when music will not be there. I do get the score crashed down, I do hear it. I've stopped trying to work against it because I'll get really angry in my room and start shoving everything up and everything will be so loud by the end. You know, it's just, it's, it's part of the nature of what I do, and it's, it's one of those things, it's a lifelong battle with music. While I love it, it's a pain in the butt because it's always a shuffle. You know, you only have so many frequencies, you only got so much space, you know, and the battle to come, you know, which, what, what, you know, what gets priority. And, and, you know, as a sound designer, it's one of those things. I mean, I've been on movies where, I, I remember early in my career, you know, and this is no kidding, I remember doing this movie and it had this, you know, war scene, and I spent so much time on it. it. It was so detailed and everything, and I got to the stage, and somebody had the bright idea to remove all the sound effects and just go with music, and that's what they did. And because I was young and I had never had that experience before, I mean, I was a sobby mess, or I don't know, because it was, you know, the funny thing is nobody will ever do that to the school. People don't understand sound that much, so nobody will ever do the score, but people think nothing of it to do with sound effects, and it's just one of those things, you know? And I think part of it is the world we live in. Um, people are not very sonically literate, so it's very disconcerting. I mean, people need, often need music to hold on to and swing with because they, you know, it's, it's, a, it's uncomfortable to only have sound and no music or something. You know what I mean? Like it's, and when a director chooses to not do that and only go with sound, very interesting. It creates a very specific dynamic, and, and that's usually not what goes on. I mean, you do have that, and there are movies that will go experiment and play with that kind of notion, but the battle of sound design and music is always there, and it's, it's tough. It's a tough one. It's a tough for the guys on the stage. It's tough for the it's tough for Dan and David who run the show, you know, because they're all picking, because they love it all, but, you know, we all know that we have to pick and choose, and we have to sculpt the moment for whatever is best, and it's why I never make. You know, I've been approached for years, but if I spend three days on the sound, I'm going to fucking hear it, man. <laughs> Not necessarily good for the movie. You know what I mean? Because sometimes it, it isn't. Sometimes it sounds great on its own, and it may not dramatically. I mean, it, it, it does, but it doesn't. And so you get music or whatever, and it, dramatically it may be something that you have to be willing to throw away in a moment. And, and I'm not necessarily like that all the time. I mean, I don't trust myself that way. And, I, and, and it's not when I do my best work. My best work is going crazy and going and finding the edges. Do you understand what I mean? Like, what are the possibilities? How far can I pull this? How far can I push it? How far can I take it? And then it's a process of reeling back. So it's, it's a very interesting because it allows me to go on full exploration and present, but it also means that sometimes I'll fall in love with the thing at the edge. But I have to let it go, you know, because it's not, it's not. You know what I mean? Because I love, I'm a lover of sound. I, you know, I don't also, don't supervise so much anymore because it's become a very political game of hand holding and scheduling. And I am, you know, I'm a sound nut. I, I love sound and I love physicality of sound. I love the viscerality of sound. I love the psychologicalness of sound, the emotive qualities. I mean, just so much. And because we live in a world that is so sonically illiterate, we're musically illiterate, but nobody, I mean, I always laugh when I see people out jogging in beautiful country with headphones. To any of them. And it's the world around us is so beautiful. We get so much information all the time, and we're so in it. And sound physically affects us all the time. I mean, I, I you know, when I speak to to uh, sound people, and I may even mention this, you know, when I have to talk. Uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about sound is that I can make you grab your ears in pain or shake your pounce depending on my mood. I mean, literally, I can do that. You can do that with sound. 
and, and there are Sam, there is a whole history of sonic weaponry where you can actually, I mean, the low frequency stuff, I mean, it is shocking. That is the power of sound. And, and not only that, but, you know, we, we decipher our world every moment with so much informa sonic information, but we're, most people aren't at all aware of it. And that's very powerful for someone like me who's working on it who is aware of it, because I can play with stuff, it's like we were talking about before, and playing with sounds that are emotionally charged and that you place and you know are going to evoke a response but because people are not sonically sophisticated that way you know we're musically sophisticated people talk about music and that's it's in the realm of sound but in terms of our environment people are not and and so you can play with that it's a very powerful tool um, so anyway i think i went off on a crazy tangent. I would like to offer the sincerest of thank yous to everyone who donated to the GoFundMe and on the Super Chat on our live streams on here on Azora Hype. We had an absolute blast at Con of Thrones. We had the time of our lives. I'm kind of depressed right now that I'm actually not back in Nashville. And uh, all the people that I speak to that enjoyed Con of Thrones as much as I did kind of have the same sentiment. We're pretty much hyped for Game of Thrones Season 7, but we all wish that we were back in Nashville meeting each other for the first time, having drinks and good food enjoying all of these amazing panels and chatting thrones but thank you so much we couldn't have done this without all of you so give yourselves a round of applause and if you did like this video smash that like button the support really helps out the channel really really appreciate all the support for the channel going forward also if you haven't subscribed you got to make sure you hit that subscribe button because I'm going to be dropping Game of Thrones season 7 videos every single freaking day so you're gonna want to be on the hype train for Game of Thrones on season seven this is the place to be this is where the cool kids are we're gonna have an absolute blast during game of thrones season seven we have 20 guests coming on the channel during the season for live streams collaborations and more so thank you so much for watching this video and we'll see you in the next one seven blessings fuck the king <laughs>